I remember one story where she told me she um, she was a very pretty woman and she was carrying this heavy bag and this uh, cop for the fascist saw her and was flirting with her and was like, oh, please, young lady, let me carry it for you. And, and the whole bag was full of bombs. So she was like, no, no, it's good. I'm good. I, I can do it. And she's like, no, no, I insist. And the guy grabs the bag, walk her to her house, leave the bag. She's sweating bullets in the meantime. He turns around, leave. The bag was pretty much kept together with scotch tape. So the second he turned around, it opened up and the bomb started becoming very visible. And she was like, so she made it out by this much. She got really lucky. Ladies and gentlemen, something that's been pissing me off recently is the looseness with which the term fascism is being used. Everybody throws it around. They, this guy's a fascist. You're being a fascist. Everyone's a fascist. It's being used so much that it's lost meaning. And if words don't have meaning, then we can't have conversations. We can't have truth. So I decided to reach out. Well, I had read Umberto Eco talking about fascism, and he's dead, unfortunately. But I've got another Italian, almost as famous, Daniele Bolelli, who's been a guest before on the podcast. He's a historian. He's a martial artist. And he's also Italian. And I know that you grew up in the shadow of fascism. And my father grew up in the... Well, I grew up in the shadow of fascism through my father. I mean, my grandfather was slated to go work on a U-boat in the uh, World War II. And he managed to bribe some admiral with a box of schnapps or trade of schnapps, and he ended up working at the submarine factory instead. His best friend went and worked on the submarines and died, the U-boats, and my grandfather survived. So I met my grandfather briefly, who was, by all accounts, rather scarred by having lived through the war and kind of a grumpy old, not very pleasant man. So so the history of fascism runs in my uh, family, and obviously you're Italian, Mm -hmm. as you can guess from your accent. And so what was your sort of brushing up with fascism as you grew up? Yeah, it was trippy because my grandma, one of my grandmas was um, very much involved in the resistance in Italy during fascism. And, you know, most ladies who were involved in the resistance, they were just uh, smuggling weapons or doing other stuff. Like she was actually involved in combat actions and just the whole thing was like, I think she had a boyfriend that was uh, in the resistance and was caught by fascists, chopped into pieces, put in a luggage and left the luggage outside the guy's house. So that was sort of her transition from I sympathize to the, with the resistance to, no, screw you, I'm going to be part of it in a real way, which was kind of nuts in a lot of ways because the average lifespan of somebody joining the resistance wasn't very long. You know, I, I forgot what it was for Italy. In France, it was something like six months from when you joined the resistance. Uh, Italy, I doubt it was much better. So it was a scary thing. And, you know, you are, I forgot how old she was. I think she was 16 or something. So it's a pretty scary kind of thing. And she had all these wild stories that she didn't like talking about much because, of course, they are, you know, there's so much scattering and PTSD associated with it. Mm-hmm. But, like, she would tell some of the less disturbing ones. Like, I remember one story where she told me she um, she was a very pretty woman. and. She was carrying this heavy bag and this uh, cop for the fascist saw her and was flirting with her and was like, oh, please, young lady, let me carry it for you. And and the whole bag was full of bombs. So she was like, (laughs) no, no, it's good. I'm good. I I can do it. And she's like, no, no, I insist. And the guy grabs the bag, walk her to her house, leave the bag. She's sweating bullets in the meantime. He turns around, leave. The bag was pretty much kept together with scotch tape. So the second he turned around, it opened up and the bomb started becoming very visible. And she was like, so she made it out by this much. She got really lucky. But, uh, but you know, other stories were less, uh, more disturbing. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I was playing, uh, I would play basketball at this one gym in Milan. And then I rem- she never told me a thing about it. And then I remember reading afterwards how uh, several of the people in the resistance with her, most of her friends, were actually captured at some point, lined up on a wall at the very gym and executed right there. So I'm thinking about like the difference between uh, war for somebody who's like a soldier and going out there on the battlefield. And, you know, it's traumatic as hell in a thousand ways and people come back with major PTSDs. 
But I also think of what it must have been like for her, because for her, the battlefield mm-hmm. field was right outside their door every day in the city she grew up in, in the city where she lived the rest of her life. And every day she probably went by places like, you know, taking your grandson yeah. to the gym and you see the place where your friends got executed. You go down the street and these other things happen. And so it's a pretty... Intense. It's a much smaller and lesser example of that. But I know working for a firefighter for 22 years or 23, 24 years now, driving through the municipality in which I work, it changes your geography. Oh, that's where that multiple MVI was. Oh, mm-hmm. that's where I did that CPR. Oh, that's where the big fire was. And it's kind of, it's kind of, I don't know, a map of trauma, mostly other people's trauma, yeah. but it would be very different. It would change the city that you live in into a map of trauma and your own trauma and the the trauma of the your friends and your family and the people that you know and the butcher down the street who was hung up from this lamppost and the mm-hmm. boyfriend who was cut up into pieces. Yep. No, and that's why I'm like, man, you know, I remember my grandma being always, she's always nice, but she was always had a heavy vibe, was always a little mm-hmm. negative about things. And then I, the more I dug up about her, the more I was like, well, <laughs> I can see why. I can see the logic of why she was carrying all this heavy stuff with her. So, you know, that's uh, one side of my family. On another level, there's this um, pretty good... Uh, uh, I guess technically he's my step grandfather. Yeah, because he's the father of the guy who married my mom later. So this guy, he's now ninety six years old, I believe. He was the head of this partisan unit where the guys who actually arrested Mussolini. So when Mussolini was trying mm-hmm. to escape Italy, he was and very rarely would because uh, yeah, Mussolini was with the German column when he tried to escape Italy. And almost never the Germans signed a surrender with partisans. They always wanted an Allied officer there. And that was a very rare case where it did happen. And so his signature was one of the ones on this surrender where essentially they made a deal and the Germans said, OK, you let us go and we leave you all the fascists and we don't get into a giant gunfight and, uh, you know, do whatever you want with these guys, but you let us get out. And if we get shot in Germany, it's our business, but we are leaving. And they're like, okay, fair enough. And that's how it worked out. So yeah, pretty crazy stories. The French resistance gets all the press and all the references in the movies. And I mean, it, when the inglorious bastards meet up with the resistance, it's the French resistance. We don't hear as much about the Italian resistance. Is that just because the Italian side of World War II is less well understood than the German side of World War II, do you think? Or was it a, a smaller could partisan be, resistance? Could be that is an easier story in France, because for the most part, you had the uh... You did not have, uh, granted, you had a bunch of collaborators, but you did not have a Mussolini figure. Like, France did Mm. not start the war on the German side, whereas Italy did. So Italy gets more complicated because you don't have the, you have both sides very strong. The the fascist and the anti-fascist were both extremely strong in Italy. So it's a messier story because it's like, well, Italian, which Italian? You know, I think it's more complicated. Whereas with France, you know, you have the occasion, the collaborators, but you also primarily you had the French resistance against uh, Nazism, whereas in Italy it was much more of a mixed bag. So more of a civil war type yeah. of situation almost. Yeah, big time. Like not even almost, very civil war. Yeah. Well, all we need... I've, thought we would call this episode or one of the names I was bouncing around was a German and Italian walk into a bar, but we'd need a Spanish, uh, Spanish guy as well to, right. uh, to cover the full scope of Western European yeah. fascism in, in the world war two era. But, uh, so I know on your, you, you've got a podcast, the, mm-hmm. which is very well history on fire. It's, it's an amazing podcast. It's one of my favorites. Uh, and I know on a Patreon episode, you did something on, fascism uh and i i what do you think a good working definition of fascism is i mean i've been looking at uh jason stanley i've been looking at uh umberto echo and i've been looking at a few other people and there are certainly some some themes uh the 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 side of the argument i have not looked at is the bolsheviks like the the russians because they had their own definition of what a fascist was which kind of excused them from 
any kind of adjacency. Uh, but, but what is what what for you is the sort of the, the central attributes of of fascism? I think for me, because uh, fascism is notoriously difficult to capture in a single definition. There was a historian named uh, Ian Kershaw who said, uh, trying to define fascism is like trying to nail jelly to the wall. And that's because, especially initially, there was a lot of Mussolini being very willing to shift, uh, flirt with different ideologies for the sake of power. Clearly, not everybody was Mussolini. They were not just about power. They were also true believers in some ideas. But those ideas shifted over time. Like, I'll give you an example, and then we get into the specifics. Like, the whole uh, anti-Semitic laws that were passed in Italy, that is not a prime characteristic of fascism. Like, both Mussolini and most of the fascist regime did not give a crap about going after Jewish Mm -hmm. people. He was more sort of the price to pay for being allied with Hitler. This was a Hitler thing. It was strong with Nazi Germany. And Italy kind of got dragged into the process. They gladly went along, but they were like, eh, I guess we got to kill Jews. That's sure, fine, we'll do it for you guys. But it wasn't like one of their primary things. On the other hand, they were ad- and also the thing that gets crazy about fascism is that You know, you get uh, Grifter, Salah, Dinesh D'Souza kind of thing who try to argue, oh, you see, fascism started out as a socialist movement, so it was a left-wing movement. When No, just because the word national socialist is the root of Nazism. At the very, very beginning, before it even was fascism, Mussolini was writing for a socialist magazine, Mm -hmm. was part of a left-wing movement, all that. That quickly changed. And eventually he started aligning himself instead, especially during a period where labor unions were becoming really strong and protesting some of the working conditions for the poorest people in northern Italy. Mussolini made the jump and switched sides where he started going, becoming the muscle for the industries against the unions. So a strong anti-union thing is the thing that launched fascism. And at that point, he went from being a tiny movement of like a thousand people who were ideologically all over the place to become a clear, taking a, what will become known as fascism afterwards. And, you know, one of their first thing was anti-unions, you know, strongly tied to business interests and strongly against labor unions. I mean... <laughs> Lex Friedman wanting to interview Hitler in 1942 in order to get into his head. Yeah. That's a re- that's something that's happened recently. It's ridiculous because we know exactly what was in mm-hmm. Hitler's head. It was written in the 30s. It was Mein Kampf. And so yeah. Nazism at least had, consistent is the wrong word, but a, an internally consistent ideology for the whole time. We hate the Jews. We have to go into the East. Uh you know, the German super Ubermensch is mm-hmm. all powerful. Whereas it does seem that uh, that's not a requirement. As you pointed out, Mussolini was all over the place. I believe he was also an atheist, but then allied with the religious authorities. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's power for, for, for its own sake at any cost, in any allegiance, in any direction. It's all good. So you don't need to have a core ideology necessarily for something to be fascism. But it is very useful to have a whipping boy, to have an enemy, whether that's the labor unions, whether that's the communists, or whether that's the Jews. And I think that's where it becomes important, too, because a, a specific one war, like one line definition, dictionary style, may be tricky when it comes to fascism. I think the, important, the next best thing we can do is look at all the policies that fascists strongly supported, and based on that we can get a sense of uh, does a certain movement fit the definition of fascism or not based on what they did. We're not arguing semantics, we're not arguing, you know, because as you said at the beginning, people use certain words almost as slurs to insult somebody. And it's like, no, it has a specific meaning. You know, if you check, if there are 15 policies that fascists supported and you check the box for 13 of them, Maybe you want to think that, yeah, you're a fascist. You know, if you check the box for two of them, eh, probably not. You know, you have some things that you like that they like. But, and I think, I mean, I was having a discussion with somebody online where they were uh, 
uh, well, do you think uh, I'm a fascist? And I'm like, I don't know, you tell me. These are 15 things they supported. What do you believe? It's like, yeah, I stick to most of that. It's like, well, then, yes, you're a fascist. You know, that's the, now you have a new word, new word you can use for yourself. Because, but if it's just one or two things, probably not. Yeah. But There's a guy called Roger Griffin who tried to define fascism, or at least the, the central conditions mm -hmm. for fascism in a single sentence. And uh, I've got it up here. It's fascism is a political ideology whose mythic core is in its various permutation in its various permutations is a palingetic form of populist ultranationalism. So palingetic has got the idea of rebirth, right? It wasn't the Third Reich. It was yeah. the Second Reich. It's the rebirth of the glorious people. Sure. Sure. I don't know the Italian situation as well, but I'm pretty sure Mussolini was referring to the Romans, right? right. <laughs> Where right. And the, the peak of whatever Italian state he had during the Middle Ages that he probably won. We were glorious once and we can be glorious again. So this, yes. I think that's a pretty succinct sentence. You know, there's a a, a populist ultranationalism that's focused on rebirth and like yeah. a, a rising up and, you know, getting rid of the weakness that's, that has accumulated and... Uh, that's a pretty good. I mean, he smuggled about four different concepts into that one sentence. Yeah, there's something there, right? There's the idea of nostalgia for a mythic past, hundred percent. That's for sure is there. I think is one of the elements. It's not necessarily the defining one because there are a bunch of other movements around the world that is nostalgia for a mythic past that are not fascist. But that can, can you go into this nostalgia? Can you give yeah. some examples from different cultures? I mean. Almost every culture has a golden age ideal somewhere where it used to be great. You know, even if you look at like uh, in Hinduism, there's this idea of the different ages of the world. And you start with like this age where everything is great and wonderful and the world got destroyed and the next one a little less so and the next one. And so you have this sense of like there is this back in the old day, days golden age kind of thing that's fairly it's almost a human archetype you find it almost everywhere because that's what you know anytime we struggle with the present and all the contradictions and problem of the present we all like to think of once upon a time it was wonderful and great and then we lost the way and we just need to go back i mean in some way like Confucianism, for example, is exactly like that, right? It's all based on this idea that there was once this mythic past of the ancestors who had it all figured it out, and all our problems began when we abandoned the way of the ancestors, and so we don't need to create something new, we need to go back to the original harmony of it all. So you find we need to make China great again. Yes, absolutely. But so you find stuff like this everywhere, right? And uh yeah. It has, there's definitely, like, one of those elements is very strong in fascism, but I wouldn't say that that's the one and only for, yeah. for fascism. It's, certainly, it's a very common theme, though. It's a very common theme, and it's an important one. Nationalism, big time. That's one huge difference with communism, for example, because a lot of boxes that you're going to see between, like, hardline uh, Stalinism versus fascism, you're like, they kind of check a lot of similar boxes, but like yeah. uh, the, the communism, the theory was international, was never for just <laughs> this pure, strong national, nationalism, it was about workers of the world unite, whereas fascism has always been tied to nationalism, to, you know, our nation, our people, our, all that kind of stuff. So less of a class dimension. I mean, there is a class dimension too, but less so and much more so a nationalistic dimension. So that's another key element, you know, nostalgia for the past, for sure. Um, nationalism, that's another big one. Usually very much hawkish when it comes to warfare. Like the original breaking point between Mussolini and the socialists was when the socialists were firmly against intervention in World War I whereas uh, Mussolini was very much in favor. It was after this that he started radically breaking with socialism and adopting all sorts of different ideas. Uh, you did mention the role of religion, that even though quite a few fascists were not necessarily super religious, they do make alliances with the powers that be, with the Catholic Church in this case, in other places may not be Catholic, but similar concepts. You know, there's usually a strong tie 
It's a strong tie with the traditional power structure, because even though fascism presents itself as a revolutionary movement that's upset in the status quo, the reality is that the people they ally themselves with are the traditional power structure, are the industrialists, are the big uh, titans of industry, they are the church, they are, you know, all the guys who used to carry more weight and then got disturbed by some of the more pro-democracy movement of the 1800s, early 1900s, and fascism goes back to those guys. So that's another element right there. Um, this element of struggle is something that Umberto Eco talked about sure. in his uh, essay on Ur fascism, saying there's no struggle for life, but rather life is lived for struggle. Yeah. And this is, if you, if you follow the things that, you know, the example that I'm most familiar with, what Hitler wrote and what Hitler said. And at the end, I mean, when Germany fell to the allies and to the Russians, he thought it Germany deserved it because they had not been strong enough. The whole, you know, cleansing experiment had failed. The, the, the purpose of fascism in the German people was to fight. So you would end up in a situation where everybody is fighting everyone all the time. Uh, it seems very sustainable in a world with lots of nuclear weapons, actually. Right. It's, uh, yeah, that's a great way to look at life. That one is a tricky one, too, because it's um, if you think about like there are a bunch of people, for example, that believe that one of the father figures of fascism was Gabriele D'Annunzio, the Italian poet, who when he, um, you know, he and some World War I veterans took over this part that will later become Yugoslavia that they said he was supposed to be Italy. So for like a year and a half, they were in open rebellion against also the Italian government that did not want this. And uh, the thing is that I disagree with that interpretation because D'Annunzio had a bunch of people following him were very much, like people look at a lot of stuff that the D'Annunzio movement had and look at the fascist stuff and they're like, ah, oh, there are a lot of similarities. It's like, yeah, that's because Mussolini try to copy the style of D'Annunzio because D'Annunzio was so popular. So the speeches at the balcony, the certain phrases, certain slogan, this cult of action, this cult of adrenaline, this cult, that's all D'Annunzio. But that doesn't mean that D'Annunzio is a fascist, it's more that the fascists borrowed from D'Annunzio some ideas. And the thing that makes it interesting is that with the Nuncio among the World War I veterans, there were people who later became ultra-fascist, but there are also people who later became the resistance against fascism and shot each other with the guys they used to be friends with. So that's why I tend to, in some cases, is a little tricky, because you see, you check a couple of boxes, and you're like, oh, this was a fascist thing, and you're like, no, it's a little more complicated than that. Not everybody who checks uh, box A through C is a fascist. Um, there are tendencies that could go there, and fascists definitely use those things, but you could also check those boxes without being a fascist. And the Danunzio example, to me, is a big one, because he and Mussolini really didn't like each other despite the fact that Mussolini was copying his entire shtick from D'Annunzio. <laughs> because D'Annunzio was just cooler that way. He had uh, that, you know, uh, women adored him. Uh, he was a popular hero in Italy. Would The guy would stop traffic down the street anytime he walked out. And this guy was a poet. Can you imagine, you know, a poet that has the rock star status, right? And, and Mussolini very much copied that style. Um but that's why, to me, it's interesting to have almost a checklist of all of those things. Because, yeah, you can have one, two, or three of these things, and it doesn't mean fascism. But when you put them all together, you would be hard-pressed not to make the case that if you have 15 of those, it's still not fascism, you know? There's something that was pointed out to me, that a characteristic of fascism is this idea that the enemy is both mm -hmm. simultaneously very weak mm -hmm. and very strong. Mm -hmm. And in the German example, if you read or look at the German propaganda from World War II, the sniveling little Jew is what? a weakling, but he's also incredibly dangerous. The, uh, the Slavs are these subhuman weaklings. They will surely be subdued by the superior German, but they're also incredibly dangerous. And this, the enemy is very, very weak, and the enemy is very, very strong. I don't want to drag this too much into today's politics, but when I see people talking about, you know, the war against wokeism. Sure. Those soy sipping latte girl boys, you know, yeah. who like pedicure their fingers, they're all weak. 
but it's also the most dangerous thing you've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> this, this, this is, is that somewhere on your checklist or am I just going off on a tangent here? No, it's not on my checklist, but I like it because it makes sense. I mean, it's something that people do where it's always the enemy on one hand that doesn't deserve respect. They are these wimps that are nobodies, and yet they are out oppressing you and clearly they are the powerful. And it's like, pick one, you know, choose one. Or either they are uber powerful mm-hmm. and they are tough and strong and you hate them. So tough and strength, toughness and strength doesn't mean good. It just means they are strong. Or you can say that they are weak, and if they are that weak, they are unimportant. You know what I mean? They, that means they are not. This idea that you want it both ways, that the enemy is weak and uber powerful, is just comical. You know, it's just like, come on, let's be real here. But I suppose, though, if if a part of fascism is this idea of strength, and mm-hmm. strength above everything else, and strength over intellectualism, and right. strength over education, and strength over scientists, and strength over research... You can't paint the other side as strong too, of course. <laughs> because then they're then they're kind of equal to you. So they need to be dangerous, but we're the strong ones here. They're yeah. the weaklings. It, it would be very dangerous to say they're strong too, and we're strong, and everybody's strong, but they have a different ideology. So you know, pick us. Well, why would we pick you? I could pick the other. You tell, told me how important strength is. I might as well go with the other guys, maybe. And that's not a that's not a good selling point. And that's actually, I think, something that also leftist ideologies have really screwed up because uh, fascism has played this uh, idea that they have a monopoly over strength. And so a lot of leftist intellectuals reacted by arguing, oh, then anything that emphasizes strength must be, it's a fascist thing, it's a bad thing. And it's like, no, strength is, strength is good. There's nothing wrong with strength itself fascist strength i have a problem with but strength in itself why would you give it away to your ideological enemies why would you grant it i think that was always been a really dumb leftist thing not everybody of course but plenty of people who have gone that so for example growing up in italy i remember a lot of things that i like were considered fascist you know, a lot of fiction, there was like heroic fantasy or Tolkien, mm-hmm. all the myth, all of that was considered fascist. That is like, how the hell is this? Fa-? This is not, mm-hmm. unless you assume that, yes, strength and toughness and disciplines are fascist thing, but what the hell are you doing? No, they are not fascist thing. They are things that fascists emphasize, but also things that any bunch of other people emphasize throughout the world without being fascist. So... That I always thought was uh, was actually a good marketing campaign by fascists in the way they played it because they were able to associate themselves with things that most people, anybody, like. And so unless they are ideologically savvy, they are like, oh, I like these guys because they are the strong ones. Where it's anything but that in reality, but that's the, the marketing operation. You did mention one that was very interesting. So you did talk about the anti-intellectualism of fascist movements. That's a very strong aspect. There is. Can you this, give some examples? Distrust of uh, universities, distrust of uh, overly educated people, of writers, of intellectuals, of all that art for arts. You know, there's always this sense that is. Uh, dangerous leftist ideas start propping up unless you are in the trenches sweating and fighting. And so there's, at least ideologically, there has always been this emphasis on action versus thought. And don't get me wrong, you know, we're both martial arts guys. We, we all like action. We all like mass, like physical life, strength, all of that are things we value. But uh, fascists very much tend to emphasize these against the intellectual side, not as uh, let's unite the two, but very much against it. It's not either or. No. That's, it's a, that's, a, that's a simplistic dichotomy, and it's a fake dichotomy. It really is. And unfortunately, something that also some uh, leftist groups have done, they, they accepted this dichotomy, saying, no, no, it's because the intellectual virtues are great and those vulgar physical things. And you're like you guys are just as stupid as these guys. This is just not... Why would you buy the kind of stupid, ultimately suicidal dichotomy? Because human beings are made to have the best of multiple aspects, not to choose one over the other in parts of themselves. So, but yeah, anti-intellectualism is a big one, for sure. 
Uh, one that's worth mentioning too is the role uh, regarding women. Which is funny because the whole the reason why I did the Patreon episode was precisely because there's a woman prime minister in Italy, and a bunch of people are asking, "Is she a fascist?" and all of that because traditionally so that's a weird one, right? Because traditionally fascism has had very strict, more traditional gender roles: women as housewives, yeah, women as mothers, women as housewives women working as little as humanly possible outside of the household, cracking down hard on birth control, uh, cracking down hard on abortion, pushing policies to try to encourage families to have a ton of kids, uh, because again, it's more cannon fodder for the military machine, whereas you conquer the empire kind of thing. And so traditionally, the role for women in fascism has always been a very subordinate role which is kind of funny in terms of like the way Italian resistance work, because one of the reasons why so many women were active in the Italian resistance <laughs> smuggling weapons is because fascist stereotypes held that women are, they are soft, delicate creatures, they are incapable of violence, so you don't check the women for weapons, you check the men. So of course the women would be the ones carrying weapons and and so it's, but yeah, the gender roles is a big one. And clearly that has changed over time because today you have a, quite a few ladies who are of neo-fascist persuasions who are very op- active in the public sphere that is not the way it would have been back then but that almost that's a testimony of the fact that they lost the cultural battle right the fact that even fascists would now go the route that everyone else goes which is yeah okay i guess uh, women outside of the house although women even in leadership position can exist but they've always fought against it it's like reluctantly they are heading there but their view has been this strong uh, very macho vibe to it all and women as the domestic ones and that has been the traditional approach big time well, I do want to get through this checklist, but I'm also going to dive down the rabbit hole. Yeah. So on your checklist of 10 or 15 mm-hmm. points, uh, well, let's skip to the conclusion. Where does Maloney, the uh, the female prime minister of Italy, uh, land, would you guess? I mean, she checks a lot of boxes, for sure. She does check a whole lot of boxes there. Does she check them all? No, but she does check a lot. So to me, it's... Uh, it's... It's kind of a neo-fascist thing. Of course, neo-fascist today is... uh, I mean, sometimes people are all like, oh, you know, if they are a fascist movement, why don't they just take power through force? And why do they concede elections or all of that? That's a power thing. You know, if uh, people are making their calculations, if they think they can get away with pushing the strength factor, maybe they would. It's certainly interesting that when looking at a lot of those policies, somebody like Meloni supports a lot of them. Now, is she a one-to-one ratio to what Mussolini was doing? No, not at all. But is she flirting with a lot of those concepts? For sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately, uh, the German, in the German fascism example, they did come to power Mm -hmm. uh, properly. I mean, (laughs) they did did go in an election. They only got 30-odd percent mm-hmm. of the vote but the other people didn't get a whole lot more yep. and they went through the proper processes and once they got there then they just destroyed the field after them like we got here legally or semi-legally if you don't count burning down the reichstag yep. in, a, in a false flag mm-hmm. communist operation which is probably what happened here it, i can't believe i'm actually talking about false flag operations this fucking term has been used Why so not? much by alex jones but and yeah, they, a false flag operation of of one person is, yeah. is kind of easier to explain than saying a false flag involving the entire CIA right. and the entire NSA and every construction worker in New York City. Anyhow, I'm I'm dialing myself back in. Yeah, they the Nazis did come to power semi legally, and then they destroyed yep. the any processes by which they could be replaced. Absolutely, with strength yeah. ultimately. Yeah. In fact, there is a kind of anti-democracy vibe to fascism, for sure, right? There's uh, 
whether they come to power that way or not, that's a calculation of how much strength you have and what you can and cannot pull off. But ultimately, they are totalitarian movements. And uh, in that sense, it's not different from uh, Russian communism. You know, it's a totalitarian movement that's squashing options, that say, in our way is the only way, and is trying to consolidate power in their hands, for sure. That there's no argument about it. Can we talk a little bit about the anti-democratic aspect of this? It, it does seem to me, and I, I haven't read as much about this, but it does seem that there's always the appeal to kind of a, a father figure, a Mussolini, a Hitler. Uh, yeah. This person is going to save us. Uh, you know, like, you know, it's kind of funny because the number of times that people have uh, accused me, you know, like posted, govern me harder, daddy. Mm-hmm. When I've said things like, you know, masks work. Right. Uh it's it's actually saying, please govern us harder. You know, please Mussolini take power. Please Hitler take power. Just fuck this democracy stuff. You take power and you show us the way. Is is that? Am I just cherry picking examples, or is that? No, a, a no that's huge. That's huge. I mean, it's like I don't want to play it overly psychologically, but really, a lot of fascism is tied to people who have serious daddy issues who need a strong. Uh, father figure who's going to say, don't worry, all those bad things that happen out there, they are the fault of ABSC, those are our enemies. Listen to me, I will restore our former glory, everything is going to work out, just listen to the sacred dogmas and wave the flag and we'll be good. And and that's the same thing why people join cults, it's the same thing why people like dictators, it's the same, because life is scary and complicated and messy and the evidence is sometimes contradictory and it's hard to think for yourself when things are messy and complicated. So having the strong figure who say they have all the answers and is going to take care of, of it all, it's very appealing. It's something that a lot of people crave and badly, badly want. Is um, so. I mean, I think really when you look at it, this desire for a strong father figure is huge in fascism. Is also huge in other movements that are not fascist, but is definitely something that is part of the equation. Hundred percent. There, there's not even a question about that one. Yeah, I, I can't think of any fascist movements. I mean, we would all agree that there are certain fascist movements, mm-hmm. despite even if we disagree about the definitions. But I can't think of any that are commonly mentioned that don't involve that, you know, save your father figure. Yeah. 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 No, in fact, that's why to me, that's a big one that I would definitely put it there on the checklist. It's um, in what you are saying regarding laws and rules and democracy and government. That's where like the Dinesh D'Souza kind of guys find a way to weasel their way to make a counter argument that's counter to all the evidence. But the way they can play it is because, Unlike super libertarian right-wing movements, fascism is clearly not libertarian at all, right? It's like it's very strong central government. The economy is definitely not a free market capitalism. It's very pro-capitalist, but not in a free market kind of way. It's the strong alliance between the state and the titans of industry. So it still benefits the heads of uh, the uh, of industry, but is done with the power of the state behind it. It's not free market and it's very heavy in terms of um, regulations and laws like the state run the show. It's not the traditionally, you know, it's funny to hear it today because you hear a lot of people speak of like anarchist movement today and you have like a right wing anarchist. That was never a thing, you know. Anarchism was like extreme left wing, was as left wing as it ever got in that sense. But over time, things have shifted, particularly in the US, where uh, you, know, you do have a libertarian thing that tends to ally itself more to, with right-wing politics than left-wing politics, even though they are clearly against a set of right-wing politics. That's the one that's all about super strict law and order and uh, regulations and this and that. So it's... It's a tricky business, and that's why you know the, the Nash de Souza guys come in and say, "Oh, you see, they are a li- they want a strong state, so it's a left wing thing." And it's like, no, it's not. That's what all fascist government have done: is very strong state and being socially with every right wing point of view you can think of. So it's a little more complicated than uh, the traditional boxes. So, 
there could be right wing movements that are more libertarian and not centralized state. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm thinking like survivalists in Idaho. Yep. Uh, but not all right wing movements are anti libertarian or are libertarian. Correct. Some of them are like, please seize power or at least, I don't know, give gigantic tax breaks to the giant companies yep. and, yep. uh, and let them become part of the state. I, I mean, obviously in, in Germany that happened, like all of the big German companies ended up involved in the war effort. Uh, the same thing happened in Italy, I'm assuming? Absolutely. Same thing in Italy, for sure. Yeah. In terms of another German-Italian comparison, the, the 1920s and the 1930s were total chaos mm -hmm. in Germany. Post-World War I, there was massive, massive inflation, like the middle class just got destroyed yep. through inflation. And then there were like armed bands, the Freikor, uh, basically bands of soldiers marching around, you know, like reliving their World War One glory and, and mm -hmm. banding together and absolute chaos. And a, I think a big part of the appeal, you know, like the Nazis are the party of law and order, despite the fact that they're fighting with the communists in the street, but that's how they pitched themselves. Yeah. Uh, what was Italy like in the 20s and 30, 20s and early 30s? When did Mussolini come to power again? I forget. Uh, let me look at the exact date of the March on Rome. I want to say it's, you know what, let me check it out before I tell you something stupid. So, March on Rome was... Uh, 19... what, point, what are you doing looking at data? Data, it's more how you feel about things, Daniele. Yes, I feel it was in 1922. But, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so shortly after uh, the end of World War One, and uh, in that kind of chaotic post World War One period, that's when uh, they seize power. But again, like the thing about the way they started making their mark was really by cracking down, becoming the muscle for industry, and cracking down against labor unions. That was one of their first things. And when they did that, which, of course, they were breaking with any left-wing sympathizers of the movement, they uh, also started embracing 300% all the very conservative social issues. So they were very anti-abortion. They were against birth control. They were against homosexuality. They were against... Uh, uh, back then, of course, today is not because everybody divorces, but back then against divorce was a big one, which they lost that battle too clearly so that it's not something that they bring up anymore today but back then was a huge one uh they were for this um, kind of cult of masculinity so anybody who didn't embody that type of approach whether intellectuals or homosexuals or women who wanted to work outside of the household or the flappers of the 1920s those were all the enemy kind of thing and uh, and that's when the they that's when fascism emerges as a more clearly recognizable movement. They existed before, but that's when they kind of come out of the shell, and you can see what it's actually what it will become. So you've said a couple times that they start they shifted from a sort of a socialist left wing origin to becoming the muscle for big industry. What did that look like? Were they uh, like a a band of armed thugs with a political party, or Pretty was much. it? Yeah, uh, they'd get into power politically, and then they'd sway things towards big. Like, no, how, they started how that... as uh, thugs, uh, cracking down, kind of strike breaking, being the ones paid by a certain industry to kick the unions out and let them. And so that's how the shift happened. And they went from being barely existent as a movement. I think, if I remember correctly, they had like a thousand members when it was still in this ill-defined way to have in a quarter of a million members. So it's like whatever the original nucleus was, which was complicated ideologically and tricky, becomes something entirely different as it balloons in size to something that doesn't even come close to what it started at. I imagine it gets a fair amount of financial support from the industrialists. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, we need some soldiers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So because they are doing everything they want, you know. So it's um so yeah, those were some of the ways in which fascism becomes fascism, you know, where it becomes more uh, recognizable for what we'll know to be fascism. Okay. What about the role of 
you know, this economic collapse, or I've heard, I've heard some people argue that, you know, and I, I, I haven't looked at all the data, but every instance of fascism was preceded by a period of social instability where the middle class was uh, basically not wiped out, but put under extreme pressure and their standards of living fell. It's true in the few examples that I can think of, but is this generally, I'm, I, I mean, chaos makes any crazy thing easier. Yeah, I mean, if there's no chaos, if everything is going fine, usually whatever system existed before will continue existing. So yeah. usually you have these big revolutions when an order is crumbling, when something is collapsing and then there's people are desperate because the existing state of things sucks and they are willing to try whatever promises to uh, to supplant it. And, uh, and again, it's back to the restoration of something good. It's like... Today sucks. We are going to bring back the good old days. Just follow me. And of course, usually those guys never work. So then you go to the other ones and, you know, that whole pattern follows. So I think that makes sense. I think that uh, that fits. On the definition things, I found one that's interesting that ties with some of these things we're saying. Uh, professor from um, uh, named Jason Stanley. His definition of fascism, he says, it's a cult of the leader who promises national restoration in the face of humiliation brought on by supposed communists, Marxists, and minorities and immigrants who are supposedly posing a threat to the character and the history of the nation. And then in another line, he says, uh, the leader proposes that only he can solve it and all of his political opponents are enemies or traitors. Yeah, it kind of fits with some of the stuff that we're saying. It seems to be in line with with some of it. Having uh, talked a fair bit with the guys who do the Conspirituality podcast, it it put words to a phenomenon that I thought about, but I didn't have words for it. It's this idea of horseshoe theory. If you go mm -hmm. left versus right as a spectrum, if you go far enough one way, and we'll call, I don't know, uh, the... Cambodian communist regime or the Bolshevik regime at one end and the the Nazis at the other, they've moved so far towards authoritarianism on both sides that the, the straight line bends into a horseshoe. People refer to this as horseshoe theory. I guess the two the difference there is one is like a fascist authoritarianism yeah. and the other is kind of this left wing socialist authoritarianism, but they're getting pretty close. Yeah, at that point, it's like, who cares which one you're under? Life sucks no matter what. It's kind of like, or, you know, you have communism that's explicitly atheist, or you think about the old days of religious fundamentalism in power, where you had theocracies. Communism is basically a secular theocracy. You know, they apply the same totalitarian model, they apply the same, and I'm talking communism as the way it became, like, I'm thinking Stalinist. Yeah. Stalinist Russia, not necessarily Karl Marx theory, which who knows what, that's a whole separate topic. But like the way it played out in history, most communist regimes, they were totalitarian monsters, you know, they were absolutely terrible. And then you look at the... Lenin you know, was awful and Stalin went even further. Right. <laughs> Lenin was no angel and killed millions of people. Totally. And then Stalin said, oh, that's a good idea. Let's go even further. Yeah, so you have those guys, you have the old style uh, religious fundamentalist theocracies, which were, attra they all are the same people. They have the same mindset. They just put a different flag and ideology attached to it. But they are all the guys who are like, our way is the only way. There is no other way. Uh, we need to compromise. If we open up to any other way, it would be compromising with the enemy. We cannot do that. We cannot dilute the sacred truth with anybody else. So we'll squash them all, including our own guys who depart from uh, the sacred orthodoxy a little too much. So you are a communist. Wait, but you are a Trotsky communist. You are not Stalin communist, so we still need to kill you. So it becomes that kind of a game, right? And, you know, the Nazis did it, the fascists did it, communists did it, uh, secular, theo I mean, sorry, not secular, religious fundamentalist theocracies did it. It's just a mindset, right? It's this total control, the whole world needs to be run according to our ideology, and that's how it is. Which, of course, is... The hierarchy, and we're at the top. 
Exactly. It's the opposite of freedom of choice, the opposite of freedom of religion, the opposite of anything, right? And the thing I think, the problem with so much of politics is that people fall in love with ideologies. And so, for example, they're like, oh, since we don't like that, then we want a hard libertarian thing where no government in any scenario other than A or B is the solution. And it's like, uh, you know, that's why I like, for example, the Taoist philosophical approach where it's like, yeah, small government is good anytime you don't need big government. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, it's not a dogma. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, generally speaking, it's better to have less uh, crackdown from the top as possible, except there are situations where maybe that's the only thing that gets stuff done. That does not mean that you embrace that now in every situation you're going to need this super tough central control. But in some situations, so that's why to me, I think it's problematic because it requires people to be way too smart, because it requires people to be thinking on their feet on a case by case scenario, rather than going with the rule book of what we believe in every circumstances, regardless of context. Context matters. And changing their minds and changing their minds as new data becomes available. Exactly. That's, that's become the, my favorite addendum to my my arguments with people online, blah, 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 blah. And I'm willing to change my mind as more data becomes available. Exactly, right? And it's like, I'm not married to any damn position. I think that's the problem, that usually the thing that happens is that people fall in love with an ideology because you work for them once or twice or three times. And now they apply it in all contexts, even in cases where you really shouldn't apply because it's the terrible answer to that particular problem. But that has, by then, it, that has become their identity. So it's not something that they want to compromise about because it's not just, oh, I think this offers a solution. Is no, this is sacred. This is a sacred thing that you do not touch and don't compromise about. Whereas the reality of things is that anything, any solution is contextual, it's complicated, it requires you to look at something from multiple different point of views, it requires you to uh, borrow from different sources. It's kind of like MMA in that sense. You know, it's like so much of ideologies back to the pre-MMA days of like karate is best, everybody else sucks. No, it's like judo is the best. You guys are stupid. No, it's why crane kung fu. It's like the reality is that some school of thoughts are better than others. They do have more tools that they offer to provide solutions, but none of them offered all the solutions. And usually even some really shitty ones said one or two things that weren't that bad that you could actually incorporate. So the game becomes not a who's right, who's wrong. The game becomes a let's test things out. Let's take 20% from these, five from these, 10 from these, mix it together. Is it working? Eh, kind of, but we're a little off balance this way. Okay, then trim 5% there. Let's go the other way. Like all the debates, for example, about uh, socialism versus capitalism are completely stupid when you think about it, because there's hardly there's hardly any government that's a hundred percent capitalist free market or is a hundred percent full on socialism. Most everything falls somewhere in between. It could be eighty twenty, could be twenty eighty, fifty fifty. So the question is not an ideological position of who do we have the state involved? It's, that's, already the, that's already happening all the time. Is where do we want to draw the line? In, and that's a discussion that's much simpler to have because it's like, okay, we have a common goal. We want to make sure the economy works well. We want to make sure that everybody in the nation is having the healthiest standards of living possible. So we're not ideological enemies here that we have to fight with my idea to solve things versus your ideas. It's more like, let's try things out. Let's experiment. Uh, there's usually something to be learned from opponent's point of view. Even if it's maybe small in some cases, there's usually... So it's like borrow some partial truths from a bunch of places, try it out, and if it doesn't work, we are not emotionally attached to our idea. We're attached to whatever works. So we'll switch it. You know, if, uh, if the balance going this way, which I thought was working really well, turns out it doesn't, hey, I'll give in and go 20% more of what you suggested. And maybe it works better. And if we try it and it works better, great. We, everybody wins. You know, it's like, 
I'm a big fan of thinking in terms of solutions that please the greatest number of human beings, not one ideological faction. I think, I honestly think like ideology is a form of mental illness that way, because it's something that you are so scared of reality, you are so scared of everything that's out there in life that you have to hang on to this set of fixed ideas that become a dogma because otherwise you feel lost. It's like, hey man, just learn how to flow with it. Learn how to look at things for what they are, switch gear as you go, modify things, borrow things, change your mind. That's how you... That's how a healthy approach... I mean, and it's funny because if you look at MMA, MMA showed it physically how it works, right? It's like it's constantly been a process of taking the best from multiple things and slowly tweaking it and adapting it over time. And using evidence yep. and expertise yep. and, and adjusting... I, that's actually one of the things I find so scary about fascism is the anti-intellectualism Mm-hmm. And the resistance to expertise, yep. because you cannot be an expert in everything. You cannot be an expert in economics this week, an expert in Russia-Ukraine relations last week, sure. an expert in, I don't know, COVID variants next week, and an expert in uh, whatever the hell the next crisis is, mm-hmm. fallout management, yep. nuclear fallout management the week after. These are each fields that are 20 years of study. Yep. and the the undermining of you know the fact that there is truth out there and the undermining of the fact that there are experts out there and just because you have 95 percent of experts here but you manage to find the three phds for hire on the other side who will speak out against it oh well clearly this correlates to my this this is well seated within my ideology so i'm going to go with these three guys right i'm the uh chris round a guy a friend of mine brought up the fact that many of the same PhDs for hire who were hired by the tobacco lobby Mm -hmm. were then, you know, like to say, well, you know, the evidence on the smoking and lung cancer thing, it's not really firm. Right. Were then hired by the fossil fuel industry. Well, you know, this climate change thing, you know, we can't really be sure about it. And, and well, all opinions are equal. Who the hell knows? And my ideology says X, Y, Z. So I'm going to go with that. That's terrifying to me. It is. It's absolutely terrible. And I think what makes it even trickier is the fact that in some cases, it's true that there are experts in a field that are... that this, It's a tricky thing, because on one hand is, if you are ignorant, then you should just shut up because you don't know about a field and your opinion counts for nothing. If you become an expert, of course, that's preferable to being ignorant, but sometimes you go so narrow down a tunnel that you kind of lose focus on how to connect it to other things that would actually help make more sense of your field even. So it's almost like sure. ignorance is not the solution, obviously. Expertise is certainly a better step, but it's almost like a step above expertise would even be nice, where you have enough expertise in a topic to actually have a valuable opinion but you're also not so narrow-minded in it that you have... Because, uh, you know, there are plenty of cases in history of people who come from outside the field bringing brilliant solutions because the field has been so domesticated to doing things a certain way. Now, of course, these people were not the guy down the street who read uh, two articles on YouTube. They were brilliant people who still work a little bit from outside the field. But so in that sense, even that, you almost need both, right? You need... And by both, I don't mean level you know i mean like well educated non 100 percent expert that also plays a role and have a voice you know i think two things are true number one significant advances within a field are sometimes made by the outsider by the lone voice by the dissident most advances within a field are made by the the majority in that field but oh. but there are definitely advances i mean the the ex- classic example there is a doctor who said, wash your hands before helping a woman give birth. He was right. ridiculed. Uh, he was uh, you know, uh, marginalized and he was right. Yep. That happens and it's rare. At the same time, if at any one point you have to place a bet, uh, like, I don't know, I have cancer. Yep. What should I do? <laughs> I have, uh, I, you know, my car isn't working. What right. should I do? 
your best choice at that moment is to go with the majority consensus. Sure. There's a small chance that taking uh, fermented uh, horsetail root mixed with iodine crystals will cure your cancer. It's a small chance. Yeah, right. But you'd probably be better off with chemo. Right. Similarly, you know, if this guy who claims to fix your car by, I don't know, exposing it to a magnet or something. Yeah, it could work. Probably better just to take it to a regular mechanic. Right. I'm going to actually turn this around on you. You were arguing that experts can get too narrow. Mm -hmm. And I've known you for long enough where I know to poke you. What about experts who are an expert in one field? Oh, I don't know. Uh, say psychology. Mm -hmm. And then they become experts in every other field that there is. They have an answer for everything within that field. They also become experts in climate change, right. nutrition, politics, Russian-Ukrainian relations. Uh, who would the name of that person be, Daniele? <laughs> My favorite guy, Mr. Jordan <laughs> Peterson. God, man, it's funny. It's like speaking of vibes, it's like first time I ever saw a Jordan Peterson thing where people were going nuts for the guy. I was like, ooh, there's... So and, you know, some of the stuff he was saying wasn't even bad. There were some concepts that I was like, oh, that actually makes perfect sense. So why do I still dislike this guy so bad? despite the fact that some of the stuff he's saying is not even wrong. Well, then it became obvious why. My rational mind caught up with what the problems were. But I think in relation, sticking for a second to what you're saying specifically regarding the expert in one field, that, that's a tricky one, right? Because both things are true at the same time. It's like the fact that you're an expert in one field obviously does not give you authority to speak uh, with great insight in a bunch of different fields, for sure. At the same time, there are individuals who are clearly, they may be an expert in one field or two or three, and yet they have clearly developed a certain level of wisdom that no, they are not going to be able to give a better opinion about epidemiology than an epidemiologist. That's not going to happen. Wisdom doesn't do that. But they will allow you to maybe bring a certain something to the debate that's interesting. Yeah. You know? yeah. The problem is uh, the difference between an expert purely in a technical sense and somebody who has developed and taken some insight that they've gained from studying one field and they are able to bring them, at least in attitude, if not in specific knowledge on every field, to other things as well. Like, I'll give you an example, and this is funny because, yeah, on one end, as uh, much as uh, you poke me on my Jordan Peterson dislike, I'll tell you a funny story. Of, this is very much of how I grew up, right? Like, my dad, at one point, he taught for, I don't know, 20 years or something in a master program, one of the most famous master programs in the world about it, in fashion and design. Now, he knew nothing about fashion and design. And uh, so he's like, what the hell is he doing? Did not have a degree in it or nothing, right? And yet they had him teaching there year after year after year. And the thing is that what they had was a combination of things. You know, they had all their specialists in the field who knew about fashion and design who teach most of the courses. But then they brought him on because they liked the fact that he could connect the little that he understood about fashion and design to something about a wider world that most of the specialists did not have. So his job was kind of being the one who took some of what they fed him through their expertise and then turn it and say, hey, what about connecting with this, this, and the other? And the specialists were like, oh, shit, this is awesome. I like it. So it's a tricky thing, right? Because both things to me are real. It's like it does not mean that somebody who does not have an expertise in one field is going to have the greatest insights compared to the experts. The odds are very, very slim that that would be the case. You know, I'm not going to go into to my mechanic and tell him how to fix my car. It's like, no, that's just not because I watch. I watch twice two videos on YouTube. No, or I change my tires. That's not going to happen. At the same time, there's something to be said for people who learn principles rather than just technique. You know, it's kind of almost the Miyamoto Musashi, right? It's like once you learn the way of the sword, you can, like, there's the whole idea of, like, you can see the way broadly. And you can, because you're not learning just the technique, you're learning some principles. And those principles, you are able to use them to at least help the debate in a specific field. So it's, uh, 
it's a tricky one because I do see both sides of the equation, you know. And and I think the problem is when we pretend that uh, a literal expert in one field is equal to somebody who is not. Just, of course not. These guys have knowledge that you, as an outsider, do not have. There's no argument there. Um, but I wouldn't discount the so maybe uh, some big pic some big picture vision or yeah, how this connects yeah, to other fields. Exactly, exactly. And that can be helpful to the discourse and keep things flowing and not becoming too rigid or too almost like an intellectual ghetto, right? And like so it's not again, it's not a choice to one or the other. It's like do you want the brilliant outsider or the expert? No, I want both. Hell, I always want both. It's like because it's uh, the the specialists are gonna provide the foundation, is eighty to ninety five percent of the game. And the brilliant outsider is going to throw that one thing that may be able to make everything click when it was almost clicking, but not quite, you know? So it's um, the key word being brilliant. <laughs> and that's the problem sometimes <laughs> with, uh, you know. So before we go, I've got sort of two questions for you. Did we go through the major points on your fascism checklist? I if believe not, so. Cover them. I believe so. So uh, to go really quickly, something is like there's an aspect of imperialism that usually shows up once they have enough power. They are totalitarian once they have enough power. Big emphasis on law and order, cult of masculinity and cracking down on anybody who doesn't embody that. Uh, usually anti-intellectual, nostalgia for a mythical past. Uh, Cracking down on the women's freedoms, birth control, abortion, very much against sexual revolutions, both of the 1920s and afterwards. Uh, in favor of a hierarchical society, usually tied to organized religion. Uh, nationalism being one of the defining features, that's like a starting point for most fascist movements. Uh, against uh, labor unions and pro corporate rights instead. Uh, um, that's probably, there's more, but I think that's a good, covers the basics. Okay. And when you look around the world right now, where we are undoubtedly going through economic upheaval uh, due to, you know, extensive government spending in the last couple of years due to actual disruption from a pandemic, due to a fucking war in mm -hmm. Europe, due to supply chain disruptions, due to bubbles that started maybe in 2008, maybe earlier, depending who you... It, where do you see fascism... Where do you see dangers of fascism in the world right now? I think it's going to keep being a really strong force in a neo-fascist way that doesn't embrace necessarily the label, but will check nine out of ten of those positions uh, in a big way. Because we are at a time when, uh, I would add to all the things you listed, I would add the fact that the speed of change of the last 200 years is unparalleled compared to the previous several thousand years. So during such dramatic change, people freak out, understandably so, because the life that you grew up when you were a kid looks nothing like the life you, you have when you are 40 or 60 or 80. So people understandably struggle with such an insanely quick pace of change when it presents problems and things that we, we don't have a preordained answer that we know of because the problems are always the same. The new ones are constantly popping up. So the appeal of the strong figure who say, I'm going to fix it all, I have all the answers, don't worry, leave it all up to me, is going to remain incredibly strong. And the more you have a greater flow of information, greater interactions between different ideas in all the things that have been the opposite of fascism, the more you are going to have also the opposite pull. So they, go, they almost go together. You know, and um, so in, yeah, in that regard, I don't have an incredible amount. I don't have the most positive view because you see quasi -fasc fascist dictatorial figures pop up all over the world and uh, they are insanely popular. And, and, and it doesn't take a genius to figure out why. Same reason against why cult leaders are popular. Same reason. It's the same stuff. Yeah. Well, on that note, <laughs> I think we'll uh, we'll call this we'll, we'll bring an end to this. Uh, obviously, people should follow uh, 
your podcast. Uh, where do people find it? So uh, History on Fire was behind the paywall for a while. It's no longer behind the paywall. So you can find uh, most of the episode just about anywhere uh, where you listen to podcasts. That would be Tell Your Friends, Goldfish, Grandma, anybody who listens is deeply appreciated. And I typically do deep dives on one topic. Usually there's, I mean, the the fascist thing, for example, I did it as a mini episode on Patreon. Like usually the main story is I follow a story, I follow a character, I follow an event, something that has a little bit more of a narrative aspect to it. I tend to do a deep dive on it, tell the story in the most epic way I can while sticking to the facts and have a good time with it and then move on to the next one for the following series. Yeah. I just uh, I remember paddling on a one of my long solo trips, working my way slowly north along, mm-hmm. uh, going upstream against the river, listening to your episodes on the Spanish invasion of of the Aztecs and overthrowing the Aztecs, uh, sorry the the mod the Mexica and yeah. in the Mexico area, and it was a very strange thing paddling through this primal environment, but listening to the story of this place you know thousands of miles away so you kept me company through that and i really enjoyed that series and i've enjoyed everything else i've listened to so i do think that people should you know sign up and of course support you on patreon so you can keep on making more amazing episodes that would be sweet because yeah nobody likes paywalls but they exist for a reason because sometimes the free model is not always the easiest to make it work well you clearly need only fans to go with your with your podcast. I think the podcast plus only fans model is probably the model of the future. So there, that's, that's my contribution to the conversation. Beautiful. I like it. Mm-hmm.